I don't want to talk too much. I don't feel like I massively need to, but just for those who are going to be watching this, Bronwyn, because we are recording, um, can you just tell our viewers what your relationship to William Jackson Crawford is? My grandfather is William Jackson Crawford's grandson. Bronwyn's mother and I are second cousins. Bronwyn's great-grandfather went to Australia with, with William Jackson Crawford's son, Billy, who emigrated. I'm so, and Catherine, is there anything that you kind of instantly feel like after all these years of learning about your grandmother's story that you, you want to ask Bronwyn or Claire? Well, I, I wondered how you had found out about the, the history of the family, both of you. Um, well, certainly in my family, um, I, was, I, was, I was saying to Andy, it was a bit of a... Um, he was regarded by my father um, as a very black sheep. Um, my father was very, very close to his um, grandmother, William Jackson's wife, Elizabeth, mm -hmm. um, who'd come over to England. I mean, as a family, we understood, I mean, Andy's put me right on this, but we'd understood that after he took his life, um, the family was left quite destitute and uh, Elizabeth ended up Certainly um, in my father's memory, um, she was a living housekeeper in uh, houses in England. Um, but we think actually sort of piecing things together and certainly from what Andy discovered about the fact that the, um, the sort of the community of psychics in a way supported her and, you know, financially donated, including, which I find amazing after Conan Doyle, whose books I adored as a child, um, that they sort of supported financially. And so, and it was obviously, it was a much nicer house than we ever realised it was, quite surprised actually to go there into Belfast which we did in September and see the house and just think whoa yeah he was uh, you know it, it sort of rejigged I think our view of him but certainly he was considered by certainly by my father to be a bit of a, a waste because in a way he took his life he had three children and a wife to support and um, an actual fact the story that we that I was told as a child that my father had understood was that he had um, yes yeah, sort of walked into the lock and drowned himself which now understand to not be the case but what actually in a way started me off on all of this was that their second daughter Margaret um, she also ended up in England and I think this is why Elizabeth went to England um, because both her daughters ended up living in England and obviously the son had gone off to Australia to set up Bronwyn's line of the family um, and she was also very sickly um, and, did, and died quite young. So whether or not there was possibly MS in the family, um, as well as, as I've definitely, as Andy has suggested to me, maybe a strong autistic streak in William Jackson, which I would utterly agree with. Um, our view was that he was a bit of a black sheep, not to be talked about. Um, you know, I mean, my, I've got a book um, that was in my, because my father has died some years ago, and this was sort of one that turned up amongst his things. Although apparently a previous book by William Jackson that my father had had from his grandmother, um, he, my father tore it up and oh, said that yeah. he wasn't having it in the house. Um, and when I was sort of given this book, my mother was very much sort of like, ooh, you know, you might want to not let the children know about this because it's all a bit, <laughs> you know? And it's, it's fascinating, isn't it? As you read through it and you think, you know, chairs lifting and- I know. Um, I'm so sorry to cut in. I just think uh, I, I'm fascinated to know which of his books it is. Oh, it is, it's the um, Experiments in Physical Science. In psychical science. It's, yes. it's like in psychical science. Sorry. Oh, where's the camera? There we go. It's that one. Yeah. Okay. Not signed. Um, it is signed. It is signed. Oh my gosh. Yeah. This is the first time I've seen his writing. Oh, there you go. So that's. <laughs> oh my goodness me! That's the first time I've seen his handwriting. Yeah. I cannot find his letters anywhere. There's the possibility no. of an archive, but they can't be found. That's okay. That's a big moment for me. Yeah. I, and then I, this. Yeah, and, th and this is a letter that Elizabeth wrote to um, to um, my father, giving here, giving, um, she wrote to my father, this was basically, she sent the book to him. Wow. So that's Elizabeth's. That's um, handwriting, which I have seen on the, on the coroner's report where she gives of her- Of course, evidence. yeah. Because Catherine, what puzzles me is, do, did your grandmother believe all of this? I mean, what, what's well, the Bologa take on it? It, it was never discussed. My, I mean, I presume they must have believed it. My grandmother was a, a lovely person. She was never a church-going person when I remember her. 
but they're, they were obviously very involved in the spiritual church and that's how they got involved in spiritualism. So I think um, that did play a very big part, but I, it, it was striking to me, I suppose, even when I was young that they never went to church and, uh, you know, my mother was never brought up going to church. My aunt would have gone uh, and we would have gone because my grandfather's sisters were were involved in, in church. But now and Papa never went. And I don't know whether something happened and she lost faith or whatever. I, I've said to Andy, I mean, I've read the experiments. I like you. I mean, they're quite fascinating and yeah. they are... They're so detailed and, and you yeah. think, oh, she's been so meticulous about this. How could anybody have fooled him? You know, and yet I know deep down it can't be, it can't be true. But um, she's not the sort of person that I would have thought would be trying to hoodwink someone. She was quite young, I suppose, at the time. When it yeah. Was, but uh, I don't know. Uh, it... it it doesn't fit with the, the lady that I grew up knowing and loving, so. Um. It's interesting what Claire Bronwyn was saying just then about the uh, kind of family folklore around William Jackson Crawford. Is that something that fed down through your line of the family too? Was, was there a memory of this extraordinary thing that happened in the early 1900s? Yeah, there definitely was. I mean, I think a, maybe it's just the fact that I'm the next generation down it was a little bit more open. So I think the first I probably would have heard of him would have been in the context of, he was friends with Arthur Conan Doyle, um, which was something that as a child, you know, you knew of Sherlock Holmes, you knew these things and that that was pretty cool. Um, and so that was kind of the first bits. And I think my mother and father would have been who introduced that to me and Claire can tell you about my dad, probably he loved history. So even with um, the other branches of the family, he'd, he'd be very keen to, um, to dive into other people's histories and get as much information out. Interestingly, um, the Australian branch seemed to have created another version of the story of his death, which <laughs> mum had been certain that he'd shot himself on the beach. Um, so both stories were wrong. Bronwyn, if I can just ask you, when I've had previous conversations talking about the, the legacy that this story left, you, you had some really interesting things to say about uh, the family's perception of, of academic uh, achievement and being careful of that and not putting yourself, particularly the men, under particular stress. Is that, is that right? Yeah, I mean, the, the next generation down, his, his own son did pursue higher education. Um, and had some form of doctorate as well. Um, but he, he went on to have his own kind of uh, mental health issues, which came out in alcoholism. Um, and, and then I know that other um, uncles kind of helped themselves back a little bit is, is what I've heard from, not them directly, but from my mother that, you know, there was a choice, an active choice to not pursue a doctorate based on, on that history of well, what if it was that that pushed them too far, which is, mm -hmm. you know, it, it, it's something that you, you can come up with. I, I found it interesting when Claire um, raised the aspect of autism before, and that wasn't a surprise. And I, that's not a surprise to us either. I mean, I, that's not, um, you know, a formal diagnosis in the family, but th there is quite strong neurodivergence in, in our family. But actually, interestingly, I think the legacy that's gone come down through my line of the family is actually from Elizabeth, because my father so worshipped her. And as women in the family, we were very much like, you know, uh, Elizabeth was a strong woman who made her way successfully, you know, brought up the rest of her children on her own. And so whether that influenced her, I don't, I don't know, but it's, it's a feeling of strong, independent women. After William took his own life, Elizabeth Crawford did continue to attend seances and was present actually for some of some of the uh, Fournier Dalb uh, experiments that he carried on. So there was there was clearly no sense of bad blood between uh, the families, certainly at that point. But this is the first time in a century that the two families have effectively been reunited. And I just wondered whether you brought with yourselves to this conversation any sense of 
nervousness or any sense of responsibility for the respective individuals, William and Kathleen involved in this story, because, you know, William has not been presented in a very positive light in some of the literature that's been written about him. Uh, the implication that he was, to use modern parlance, grooming a young woman, that there was some, you know, um, sexual inappropriateness, to, to put it mildly, in his experiments. And equally, Kathleen um, was carrying out her seances. If we, if we decide that she wasn't speaking to spirits, then there would be some sense of uh, chicanery going on there that led to uh, the suicide of your forebear. Um, it, it, it could, you know, there could be some sense of friction there or some sense of discomfort between the two families. I know there isn't, but I just wonder whether that's something you pondered. Well, I have to say, I, uh, I have never felt that um, there was any sort of sexual grooming or inappropriateness. Um, I know that, uh, you know, I always felt, you know, her father was there, her family were there. Later on, her husband-to-be was there. Uh, Elizabeth was, was there. Elizabeth was involved. Um, there was all this talk about underwear and stuff but from what I see that those were used in the experiments that before the the seance went she was given clean underwear and everything so that they couldn't say anything was hidden or I I, I really I don't feel that that, that was part of of the, the history no, it was, it was a different story but um, I don't believe it it was a different age, wasn't it? It was a different, um, and I think, you know, that's something we have to be really careful of because we, um, we, we judge people by the morals of our own age and the, the norms of our own age. And I think that's something you really must be careful of in history, that it was a different age. Um, and it was, people felt, I mean, the whole sort of spiritual thing was so strong um, around that time. So many people were, it was, it was, respectable in a way that it isn't considered now now in a way science disproves everything and says it's, it's quackery it's ridiculous but there, there wasn't the, the scientific knowledge at that point and you know the world had just been through the most massive trauma of the first war thousands well millions of lives lost prematurely um, and it's perhaps not surprising that people were trying to you know, get in touch with people. There'd been no closure for so many families. They'd, they'd lost loved ones. Um, is it surprising people wanted to find a way of contacting them? And so I think people grabbed at things like, you know, so. that there were any, but even now, I mean, you know, I mean, I live in a sleepy town in Hertfordshire, but, you know, when a medium comes to town, it sells out at, you know, the local sort of venue. Um, it, that's still, uh, plenty of people believe that mm -hmm. you can, you know, and I mean, you know, you still get stories in the paper, don't you? Or, you know, life after death experiences and so-and-so's died and this is what it's like. And I think that there's a perennial human interest in what It's a happens. human need as well to, to feel that they're still connected with their, their loved ones. Yeah. And, and I don't think there was any malice intended by anybody in any of this. I, I don't, don't think, you know, I don't think anyone was tricking anybody. I think they were... You know, I think they obviously genuinely believed. It. I think Elizabeth was quite a guiding a force in this. I mean, you know, in my family there was this story that, you know, that the women had a bit of a sort of a, almost like a second sight. Um, you know, I was always sort of, you know, and, and personally I have often experienced things where I've just known something. You know, I'll, I will just suddenly know what sex someone's child is, or just suddenly know that something's coming in the post. And you say, well, yeah, I don't know. You know. Bronwyn, what, what's your take on it? What do you think was really going on? I'm not sure. I mean, I started really kind of getting into the history whilst I was at university. Um, and I found it as a convenient kind of side track. Um, if I didn't want to do my actual work and I was in the library, I'd actually <laughs> purposefully sit near where I knew all the books were. So I've had a moment, I'd go grab a book off shelf. And I'd see what I could find that day. Um, so that's how I started getting into the actual kind of the texts. And I was studying history at the time, so it's not surprising. Um, but yeah, I definitely kind of saw in the literature that there was that kind of um, 
that perception and that interpretation of the events. Um, but even as a young woman, it kind of, it didn't, it didn't sit true with me. There was something about it that I don't know if it was because I was so intently just looking for the family history aspects of it and kind of his story in all of it. What, what specifically was it that didn't sit right? As in the, the, the interpretation of, um, you know, the sexual aspects of, of, of the story and whether or not that was, that was where he was uh, coming from and that was what he was trying to do. Um, yeah, it, it never kind of rang true. I'll play devil's advocate here because some of the people who've written about the story have uh, certainly intimated that uh, an older man who is, you know, inspecting her underwear and, um, you know, moving his hands in around her skirts to see if he can find ectoplasm. Um, from a modern point of view, it's very quick and easy to jump to the conclusion that he was finding some sort of sexual excitement from that. And we ought to mention that there is a certainly a, a history around that time of uh, uh, men investigating spiritual mediums and it having, I think, quite a clear sexual undertone. I mean, if William is a red-blooded guy in the early 1900s and he is investigating a, a, a younger woman, um, it's perfectly possible that there was some sort of titillation in it for him. I, I suggest uh, that's only my personal speculation. Um, but I, I would agree with you in as much as I don't think that was the driving force behind his experiments. I think his interest in Kathleen's spiritualist powers was, was sincere. Catherine, I'd like to turn to you now. You knew Kathleen as uh, a woman, and I just want to give you another opportunity, I think, to talk about how she was as your grandmother and what you think what you think was going through her head or her, her mind at that time when all of this was happening. Well, I have no idea what was going through her mind because um, it, it seems so removed from the grandmother that, that we grew up with. You know, very down to earth lady, um, very honest, decent, loving woman. I, I just, I just don't know what what was going on at that time. Um, and as I've said to you, if I if I read it about anybody else, I would say, oh goodness, they're real charlatans. Um, but when I read the, uh, the 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 books and looked at the experiments and things I thought gosh you know they've been really detailed about that there's no way that they could have um you know faked that um so I, I cannot explain it I really cannot explain it I just can't imagine her doing anything devious or hurtful um and my feeling is that if she had felt that they were responsible for William um, committing suicide, I really do think she would not have carried on with with the seances. Well, Arthur Conan Doyle, who, who we've previously mentioned, um, I think I'm right in saying, believed that for William it was a final experiment, actually, that it was his way of saying, I know that the spirits exist, I know that Summerland, as Conan Doyle called it, exists and it's my time to go there. His associates uh, at the time said that he was, he was meant to go on a speaking tour, he had another book coming out, but at the same time, people such as Charles Marsh Beadnell were publishing pamphlets saying, this guy's a lunatic, frankly. Uh, Harry Houdini met him and, and came to the conclusion that he was mad, literally in his words, I, I believe he's mad. So, um, and they and so his associates said that it was too much for William that he wasn't a showman he wasn't someone who wanted a lot of attention he wanted his experiments to get attention because he cared about them but it was too much pressure and so that's what caused his mental breakdown that he was just too afraid I think of the the the, the, the level of attention that he was getting on an international stage it's implied in one of the books that I've read that I think he was booked to go on a tour of the United States which would have been yeah. absolutely massive um and Bronwyn, you said uh, when we were talking earlier something about there being a almost a fear of William Jackson Crawford's house in the local community, that there was this sense that something dark was happening there. Is that right? Yeah, so the family story is that people would deliberately cross the road instead of walking past the house um, in the community. So I'm, I'm not sure 
what the origin of that story is, but that was passed on to me by my mother. Yeah. It sounds, it sounds perfectly believable. It makes you wonder how Elizabeth and the children felt about that. Um, you see, interesting, I mean, certainly I knew nothing really of these seances. Um, that was clearly never discussed by Helen um, and her mother and my father. Um, you know, it was, it was very much, um, nothing was obviously said to him. There was, I think, perhaps from Elizabeth's point of view, there was a determination to completely shut down any discussion of seances um, that that did not travel to England that that knowledge really and obviously whatever Helen knew was not something she would have ever discussed with my father um, mm. like I said you know the whole thing was a bit a bit unsavory really you know killed himself as she said Catherine that was not legal thing to do at that point in time so it was very much and and this idea of you know poisoning himself you know walking into the locker is obviously the story that Elizabeth chose to tell her daughters and her grandson that he walked off into the lock and I think that's less less brutal isn't it than taking poison she you know, she knew didn't she you know there's no doubt she didn't know how he killed himself so it wasn't that she was ignorant of that but my father never knew that and as my mother said actually just as well um, you know and he very much had a sense of shame. So I mean Catherine when you when you look back at um, uh, your grandmother and her life uh, since there's one detail that I found really interesting, which is that she did call her house Nakoma, which was the name of her spirit guide, wasn't it? So mm -hmm. it's possible, I suppose, that she kind of did bring her spiritualist beliefs with her, but just decided perhaps not to talk about them. Well, I mean, I was su surprised to hear from you and um, from research that because m my mother said that she thought that the seances had stopped shortly after William died. Mum didn't seem to know a lot about it either. Um, but that was in 1920. And I know from articles I've read that they were still having seances in their own home in 1935. I mean, my mum would have been seven at that time. She and my aunt would have been asleep in bed. That They definitely didn't know that, the, that there was anything going on. Now, those were just very private um, sittings. I don't think that those were sort of public sittings in any way. Um, so yes, um, she did. She, she, she named the house Nakoma. In fact, when they left that house and moved to another house, they, they called it Nakoma. And uh, it was, it obviously did influence her in some way. But as I say, she never went to the spiritualist church. She never went to any other church. And just so people are clear, Nakoma is uh, an aberration of a, the name of uh, uh, a Native American chief, mm -hmm. I believe. So I think her spirit guide was a Native American chief. Um, but you're right that there's a photograph of a, a, a test and experimental seance in the mid 1930s, which uh, was one that I found in the Cambridge Manuscripts Archive, um, which was a, a fantastic day. Apart from I did drop a pot of raspberry compote on a very posh lady's very expensive <laughs> shoes. But other than that, it was a wonderful day. Um, and one of the photos that I saw accompanied by a series of letters was this tit for tat thing going on about a photograph of Kathleen sitting in a chair but uh, this person had zoomed the photo in and increased the exposure. I, I'm not a photographer I don't know the terminology but basically you can see a piece of string running up the inside of her leg and then up through her top. Um, and uh, you know Houdini found in his experiments that a lot of the time people who absolutely believed in their own spiritualist powers <clears throat> still um, used trickery uh, in seances because they were afraid that the, because they felt they had to convince people mm -hmm. that people wanted to see the theater of the seance, not just hear voices or not just, you know, see words being spelled out on Ouija boards. They needed to see things happening. So even though Kathleen was photographed with a bit of string running up the inside of her leg, that doesn't necessarily mean that she didn't absolutely believe in her own powers. I, I, I can't understand quite, I mean, they, there's descriptions of, of some of the experiments where they have, um, they have lady doctors there examining the family, not just Kathleen, but all the members of the family. They were, they were 
practically dressed by them and to, to exclude any concealment of all these various things. So I don't know, it's... Uh, well, uh, it seemed very thorough. I thought the experiment sounded quite thorough. <laughs> They were very, they were very thorough. Uh, William brought in a female nurse uh, to uh, physically inspect uh, Kathleen. Uh, and then I think it, I'm right in saying he also brought in a male nurse. He didn't do it himself to physically inspect Kathleen um, before seances. He also had all of the circle uh, inspected. However, what is not clear in his accounts is whether the manifestations happened on the seances exactly where people were inspected, where everyone was inspected. And Fournier uh, came to the conclusion that it was very much a group effort, that uh, all of the people in the Golaher circle were playing their part in the manifestations that took place. So if one person was going to be inspected, they were probably told they were going to be, and then someone else might perhaps stand in their place. There's also, um, uh, the fact that uh, the physical examinations were perhaps not quite as thorough as they might be today if you were smuggling <laughs> cocaine uh, through an airport. They, 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 uh, I don't want to put it too um, bluntly, but they, they <laughs> perhaps did not search as thoroughly as they might have done. Um, one of the things I found at the um, Cambridge Manuscripts Archive actually was a length of material that came out of this uh, envelope that was bundled in with Kathleen and William's archive. Um, and I went and asked the archivist what it was and she looked up with the serial number and the piece of material I was holding my hand uh, actually was a piece of material that was discovered, uh, rolled up inside the orifice of another spiritual medium. So, uh, so it was obviously, you know, it was something that, that people did. Um, it's we're so far away from it and I know Catherine you have expressed to me um, I don't know what, what you will you tell me is it a sadness or something that you you didn't get to talk to your grandmother or grandfather about it well, yes I think it, it was a I suppose an opportunity missed to maybe try and find out a little bit more about it on the other hand I've thought about it a lot and and if she'd wanted to talk about it, she could have. She could have talked to, she was very close to my mother. She could have talked to her. She could have talked to me. Um, it was obviously something she didn't particularly want to, to discuss. And I don't know the reasons for that. I imagine there was a sadness around it. I feel a huge sadness around the whole thing. Uh, I feel a huge sadness about uh, William Jackson. Uh, for somebody to feel that way that whatever has caused it is is terribly sad and um, I suppose in those days it presumably was still illegal um, in those days to commit suicide so it would have been very difficult for the family. Um, there is a, the sadness. I, I, I do regret perhaps not talking to my grandfather afterwards because he would have been slightly removed from the situation or there were other relatives at that time that might have known. I mean, Rebecca would still have been alive and um, the other sisters were still alive, but I sort of wouldn't have had to, uh, contact with them. None of the family spoke about it. It kind of gives me the impression perhaps there was almost a communal decision. Not to talk about, to talk about it. This. I mean, I would still be in touch with Samuel's son uh, and he would have known nothing about it and Samuel is uh, uh, Kathleen's younger brother. Yes, yes. Um, he was quite, a, he was a bit younger than, than the others. Um. Well, the, the thing is in a way that we're all sort of sitting here, we're all assuming that it was, you know, it wasn't real. But I suppose I find myself thinking, the more I hear about this, well, wh why did they go to all that? But why did they do all this? You know, what were they hoping to get from it? Um, I think what you describe with the experiments and um, sort of from William Jackson's point of view, I would absolutely say that, and that is the act of uh, somebody with Asperger's, you know, that, that obsessiveness, that determination to do it exactly properly, the detail, the, the pernicketiness over things, making everything just so. I mean, I could absolutely um, explain, I think, a lot of his actions. I think if, if he was, you know, if an educational psychologist were to look at that sort of behavior, you would be getting a, a nice diagnosis. Um, 
And so I think that perhaps explains some of it. But I just think, well, why did they all do that? And yeah, you know, actually, here we are sitting in judgment to a certain extent and saying, oh, this sort of thing can't happen, doesn't exist, no such communication with the outside. This, this concept, this idea of a life, of, of, of an ability to communicate has never gone away. It's always been it. throughout history as a society, that knowledge has seems to always be there, no matter what tribe, what part of the world, this sense of communicating with the past is, is an endemic part of humanity. So if in a little corner of Ireland in 1920, um, people thought that they were doing this, maybe, maybe in some respect they were. And like you were saying, Andy, this sense of actually you needed a show. It wasn't enough to just know that it was mm -hmm. happening and to maybe hear a voice in your head or to feel something. You needed to produce a show. It, it just feels to me that you can't sort of draw a line under and go, well, obviously that was then, this is now, it doesn't happen. Um, because I don't see what anybody stood to gain by this what the, the doesn't seem to have been sort of money changing hands i mean and like was, you said maybe there was money changing hands um uh, for the last two years of experiments the gollahers were paid by william jackson crawford and they were also paid by fournier um for their experiments so that so there was there was money changing hands i mean i, I can't tell you necessarily how much because fournier doesn't record it um, no nor does William Jackson Crawford. It's also, I mean, but I still take your point. And I think another thing to think about, and I know Catherine, you and I have spoken about this and Gareth Russell, the, the um, uh, historian and uh, esteemed author, I've spoken to him about it too. And um, that we're, we're talking about a time when young women really had very little agency and very little opportunity in life. And here was a situation where the spiritualism for some people did also offer, as well as having connection to the spirits and the religious side of it, it did also offer a certain amount of social capital. Um, and I think uh, certainly Houdini would talk about that, seeing that as a pattern that often uh, young women would find themselves in a position of power and authority, which simply wasn't a way, a way available to them in other ways. Bronwyn, what do you think? Are you proud of him in a way that he was capable of these experiments? I think so. There's definitely that scientific mind that he had yeah, that's something to be proud of. Mm -hmm. He he wanted to know something, so he did the most he could mm -hmm. possibly do to know that information. Um, and evidently in the circles he travelled in, you know, he was well regarded um, on one side of things. I mean, <laughs> the, the most amusing thing that about it, in, and it's usually the anecdote that I tell people alongside the Conan Doyle connection is, and Harry Houdini thought he was insane. Um, you know, the, his passion for it comes across. Yeah. Um, and I think that there's, you know, there's something to be proud of there. Yeah. Yeah. You know, and it's, it's something that is still being talked about now, isn't it? He secures himself a place in history in many respects, which... How do you, I have to ask you, um, how do you as, as two families feel about your family history being told in The Spirit Engineer? Fascinating, absolutely fascinating. Um, and it's great. I mean, you know, life's rich tapestry. I'm, I feel, you know, I say, I, I probably would now say to people, oh, someone's writing a book about my great grandfather. <laughs> <You know? laughs> and, and be proud of that actually. And I wouldn't have done previously. I think that's really nice to hear. I, one of the reasons that I'm excited about the book coming out is that even if it only sells 10 copies, that will, be 10, <laughs> that will be 10 people who are introduced to this story. And that empty space where his gravestone should be will have something next to it in some way, that his life won't be forgotten, that his family um, do know more now about, you know, how, how he passed and a little bit more about his life as well. But so does everyone else. His story is compelling. It's brought us all here. Um, we've all obviously... Google his name at some point in time and found Andy's <laughs> website. Um, and I know for myself, it was actually a surprise because it was my sister who I didn't know had any interest who had Googled um, his name again um, and come across Andy's website and, and she, she passed it on to me um, who hadn't maybe, I, I think probably, you know, every now and then you'd get curious and see if there's any more information out there and have a, have a little search. 
Um, but yeah, it, it's something that we all keep coming back to, I assume. Uh, uh, thank you so much again. And I'm just so pleased to have brought you together to continue your, your research and, and finding out about <laughs> the story. Um, right, if this, doesn't, if this doesn't save, I'm gonna uh, fall on the floor and cry, but it should be fine. It's never not saved before. Um, oh. Okay, all right. Thank you. Thank you very much. Nice, nice, nice everyone. Yeah. Nice to meet Bye. you. Bye. Bye. Bye.